Welcome to the World Builders Anvil, episode 307, Story at the Basics. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place where we will prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Let's sup from the muck of Java and build. Welcome back. Overly dramatic. My name is Jeffrey W. Ingram. And basically yours. I am Michael Miller. Always mine. <clears throat> Always basic. Sincerely. <laughs> no, no, no. There's nothing sincere about it. <laughs> Uh, yes, welcome back everyone. T- today, I want to talk a bit about s- stories. But before I do that, we should probably just wish people a happy holidays. I think this will be coming out. Uh, it'll be right after Christmas, post, I believe. Uh... <laughs> I think it'll be uh, the first episode post Christmas. So uh, we're approaching the New Year's rap- rapidly, and I believe Christmas just happened. Or it's about to, but I think it just happened. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know Christmas. What today is. Yeah. Uh, um, as we go here and post Christmas, it's just something that I want to talk about, and I mean, actually, Michael wanted to talk about too. But it's the idea of really what is a story, <clears throat> um, and and one of the things that come up a lot, you know, people talk about they want to write novels, or you know, they have a a particular purpose they start researching how to write a format of a story um which is important to do don't get me wrong but a lot of times you know if you're a novice at storytelling um you know getting overly specific with what you're doing is maybe missing the point and um you know and uh it's it's good you need to get there but sometimes you just need the experience of getting through stories and i think that's one of the things where like people who do a lot of game mastering have an advantage you're forced to tell a lot of stories uh where in today's world maybe you know there isn't much need to tell stories like how often do you use a story to illustrate a point at work um probably not often uh so uh, it's a skill not used as much by people today but it's a really important skill to know and i i think because people have a tendency to get lost and and just what a basic story is so really, the thing to keep in mind is, especially if you're starting off, whether you want to be a novelist or you don't think you need to know how to tell stories, well, you're wrong if you think that, but uh, stories are really good. Stories uh, will help you focus on what to create in your world building if you're just doing it for fun and exercise. Having a story will help give you boundaries on creating things for your world. And if you want to go to, uh, you know, tell stories in, in screenplays or in novels or in some specific form, uh, and you have trouble actually coming up with stories, maybe stop trying to create that form of a story and just start with basic stories. And so we kind of want to get down to at a basic level, what's a story and from a fictional standpoint, obviously, but you can really use this for a nonfiction setting as well if you wanted to. But I think it's kind of important before we do that is to go over what a story is not. Um, and all these things you're going to disagree with me on if you're, if you know how to tell stories because they're all parts of a story, people will tell you. But a structure is not part of a story. You know, a three-story act, a five-story act, a 54.275-story act, um, those are not a story. You know, using having a great theme or having a meme that's part of your story is not a story. An outline for a story is not a story, even though it's maybe closer than those other things are. A goal for what you want to achieve in your plot is great, but it's not a story. You know, elements like setting, characters, plot, conflict, theme, point of view, tone, style, those are not a story. Although important, important parts of it, they might be parts of it most definitely. And really I could keep going on this list forever. I was doing research for this episode and you know, I, I, I found, you know, 
a story on the fundamentals of story structure. I, I, I found a PDF on the five essential elements of a story and then eight elements of a story explained and the 11 essential story elements you need to get right. And, and so, and, and a lot of this stuff is similar, but the thing is, a lot of people have ideas of what you need to have in a story, but really, ultimately, you know, I was thinking about from doing my research, you know, and at the core, what do I think a story is? And to me, and Michael can argue if he wants to be wrong again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're so sure of yourself. <laughs> to me, a story is an explanation of an event, what we typically call a conflict, uh, that is exchanged between people. Um, and that's really it, right? You're explaining an event that happens, uh, and it's, it's to someone, you can be through a book or through your, your voice, however it is. It's really at its core, all a story is. And don't get me wrong. Characters to me make a story very important. Stories will almost always have characters if you want people to connect to them, um, you know, coming up with a structure is good because following like a three or a five act structure is a good thing to do. All those things they said a story is not can help make a story better, uh, but it's not necessarily needed. It's really you're explaining an event. And the thing to keep in mind is if you're explaining an event, there might be more than one explanation. You know, if you have two characters, you could have two different explanations, two different points of view of the story. Well, yeah, but if you're explaining a story, odds are it's from a particular perspective. So subsequently, yeah. it's usually from the perspective of a singular character. But, exactly, but what I'm saying is, in theory, you have two <clears throat> stories if you have two characters, right? You could have two stories. But uh, you have to remember it would be two different stories. You it know, always cracks – sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say it always cracks me up when you hear that there's two sides to every story because I don't agree with that. I think there's like pretty much infinite sides to any story depending on the mm -hmm. perspective. So. Well, uh, it depends on, to me how many people are involved in the story. Right? Well, that's where it, yeah. I, that's why I say the word potentially based on yeah. however many people mm -hmm. perceive the, exactly. the story. You know, it's like the idea where, you know, and uh, Michael's a huge fan of this style of fiction, but it's the idea of uh, a lot of times people come out with fiction from the what, what should be the antagonist point of view. <laughs> or sometimes, and I forget which <clears throat> book you've talked about in the past, there's one you've talked about where they, they have this – the story told twice mm -hmm. and the and second time it is literally from the antagonist point of view from the original story. Well, the, the first book is told uh, pretty much from it's, we're talking about Ender's game and the first mm -hmm. book is pretty much told from Ender's perspective. And um, the second book is actually um, speaker for the dead, which I've, I've mentioned before, I've tried to read that book multiple times and I just find it, uh, it didn't grab me, mm -hmm. but I think it's the third or the fourth book is, um, called Ender's Shadow and it's told from the perspective of his second in command, Bean. Okay. And honestly, you have to read Ender's game to understand Ender's shadow. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll still understand it, but it makes it infinitely better if you've read the first book. I tell people, just read Ender's Game. If you love Ender's Game, read Ender's Shadow because mm -hmm. it makes Ender's Game even better, and it's incredible to understand what's actually going on in the background, especially with Bean. So I think I think Ender's Shadow is honestly a better book. But you, yeah. you could not make that book without having already written Ender's mm -hmm. Game. So. But you only think that because you read the first one. <laughs> well, of course. Well, of course. Yeah. It's, it's kind of you know, the uh, snake eating its own tail yeah, at yeah. that point. No, it's, uh, but yeah, it's a great illustration of what we're talking about here. You know, it's like, you know, the thing to keep in mind is there are lots of stories out there. And when you start researching, there are a lot of very clever people who are very practiced at storytelling, who when they explain it, overcomplicate what a story is. And now on purpose, and if you listen to their advice, a lot of times it will help you good, do a good story. Uh, but if you're not experienced at storytelling, you might sometimes get lost. So one of the things that I did um, to go through this is I created what I like to call the six steps to the complete story. And I'll come up with a really corny Ooh, name for it now. at some point. And the idea is there are six steps that I think happen in all good fictional stories and probably most stories in general. Um, and uh, so we'll talk about what, what I call them and then how you can actually use them to tell a story and how you can elaborate it. To, to get it into different forms. So um, 
the uh, and also too, if you are looking for a good simple structure, I think it was the fundamentals of story structure had a really good breakdown of how to write a good three story act story. Um, but but to me, I like to think about it beyond acts. But uh, really, uh, mine could have multiple acts as many as you want in there. It could go on in infinitum. It could be your horse's head story if you really want to have <clears throat> people hurt you. Horse's head story? You don't know the horse's head joke? Uh, I don't know. Do I? Oh, uh, no, no. You would know. If, if you've been told the horse's head joke, you would not forget. The horse's head joke is a joke for the people who know the horse's head joke. The people who are hearing it are the victim. Uh, they are a the joke. victim of the joke. And essentially, the idea is it's a it's a short, it's a story format um, a joke where you tell a story of a person and you talk a little bit about their life, and then you get to the idea. Spoilers ahead that uh, they go they go to the circus. They meet this guy, and he insults them, and their life falls apart. That's the story. And and then you can retell the story about they come up with this great new skill to go back and confront the guy, they lose again. They go back to confront the guy, they lose again. And the thing is, when you're telling the joke, you can add in a lot of detail. or And you really need to if you don't want to be murdered outright. Um, um, and you can keep repeating the rhythm of the story. You know, so it's like, okay, they go through up to the big battle, they lose, uh, their life is destroyed, and you take them to an even lower point, if possible, than you did before, and and then you start building them back up, and with this new skill to go back, they get in a fight, they fail, they fall back down, re- rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and then essentially, when you finally feel like the crowd's physically going to damage you, outside of the people who know the joke, who are all laughing already, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, you, you do the final retelling where, you know, he delivers the ultimate, in, you know, comeback of all time, uh, which is really, you know, it just says F you, you know, uh, to the guy. And, and that's the punchline of the, of the story, which will make the people who've been there for 15, 20, 30 plus minutes of you messing with joke uh just be told you know the most basic comeback that they've ever heard uh but if you tell it well you can live and you can even prosper actually i don't know if you know this uh the first time i met my wife i was asked to tell the story why is it called why is it called the horse's head joke okay because the idea is where you meet the guy up you, uh, essentially, it's a circus. And so you go to the circus, you're so excited, you've been waiting to go to the circus your whole life. And, you know, at one point, you know, all the lights come down and a spotlight opens up on, you know, the slit of the tent and in walks a figure wearing a big black robe. And on his head is a very ordinate horse's mask. Okay. And he looks around the crowd and his hand reaches out and starts pointing around and it ends up resting on, you know, the protagonist and he goes, Sir, I am the horse's head, and you, sir, you are the horse's ass. <laughs> and uh, so that's why it's the horse's head joke, and that's the the point of defeat every time. And it sounds like it's the same as the the deep dark universe joke. It, 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 yes. Are you you're familiar with that one? No, but uh, if you know both of them, I mean, it's it's that simple. I mean, it's the really the point simple. the point of the joke is to eat the other person's time. So yeah. you, mm-hmm. you, you basically start off with, you know, there was, you know, in the mm-hmm. deep, deep, dark mm-hmm. universe. And you keep yeah, repeating yeah. Oh, yeah, deep, I, I, dark, and you dark, go. or dark. And you, you, you keep whittling it down. So first you start the universe, then planet, then country, then town. And you mm-hmm. whittle it down to until you finally get down to a guy, his shirt, his pocket, and a thread in the pocket, and it's white. <laughs> but but you say it very slowly and you build anticipation in the dark mm-hmm. dark universe yeah there and was it's like, a and very dark, dark you know you know that so you can elaborate on the mask <laughs> you can give details on the mask <clears throat> you can give you know more details about the uh, the way that guy's dressed but the idea is you build them up to the same point you crush it down until you get around until you're just like ah oh, fuck you and uh <laughs> you know and, and and but literally it's like the first day I met Kristen, my wife, uh, I was asked to, to tell the joke, and I did because and she I'm still likes guy. you. 
and she married me. So, uh, so if you're a good it was storyteller, I don't yeah, think it was the joke, but the good storyteller prevented by instant death. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, anyone knows my wife knows that she does not mess around. Um, so, uh, it, it was, uh, um, but it's also a great way to practice storytelling because you get to practice detail, but it's the rhythm of a story really over and over again, because if you get in my six steps, it's all there. So you have first, you know, what I like to call the before the story or, or the BS uh, exposition. Some people might call it. I don't always call it that. Um, it depends on, to me on how it's delivered. The exposition, if it's done through stories is a little bit more interesting than if you just tell people that there was the white, uh, uh, horse on the hill, you know, that is not exciting, but sometimes, you know, you have to, at some point, sometimes tell people stuff, uh, exposition is sort of what, and really it's like, what's life like before the story starts, you know, what's it like for the characters who are going to go down this journey? You uh, at some point have what I call the incident. And that's truly where your story begins. That is the thing that disrupts the life of the characters or character who is at the helm of the story. Then they're going to go on what I like to call the strike. That is the that is their plan to overcome their their problem to get past their event, and it will fail. That's why it's the strike. It's like you get up to to bat, the ball comes swinging in, you take the swing and you miss. That's the strike. And that is very important part of a story is you have the strike and then the fallout from the strike. What is the recourse? You know, so for the horse's head joke, the strike is the guy, you know, calls you a horse's ass. The fallout is, you know, you uh, lose your job. uh, Your wife divorces you. Whatever, you know, you can come up with uh, is the fallout whenever there's the strike. So the incident is you go to the circus the first time, and then the strike is you uh, you 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 uh, you get accosted and lose to the the villain, and then the fall is what happens, and the fall will lead lead you to your if you want to the next strike, and then the next strike. However many times you want to repeat that, those parts are repeatable. But then ultimately you get to a point where you hit the home run. You know, and that is the part where you're victorious in the story, you know, um, that, you know, that is the, the defeat of the antagonist in your story, the, the resolution of the event, not, well, not necessarily resolution, but it's, it's the way you, you, it's, it's the event itself and its outcome. And then you have what I like to call the after the story. And that is the resolution. You don't always need it. But the thing is, if you want people to feel satisfaction with your stories, resolutions are a way to do that. If you want them to feel uncomfortable with the story, even if it's a good uh, outcome, you, you you know you see this a lot in movies and television where they kind of cut off like the enemy's defeated and we cut to black or something like that. You can do that too, but there's usually a resolution after the story that is told to people because it helps. You know, it helps. Sh- tell the mind the story's complete. And uh, I think typically in television and movies, they don't want you to think the story's complete. They want the ability to come back with the sequel, I guess. So that's, I don't know if that's why people decide to skip resolutions after uh, their, uh, their story is finished. But um, really to me, that's it. And you don't need all of the bits for a story, the BS and the after story, you don't necessarily need for a story but they help make the story complete, make more sense. Because remember, it's an exchange between two people. So if I'm telling Michael a story in my game world, there's some bits and pieces he needs to understand to get the context of the event that that comes forth that's played out through the strike, the fallout, and the run. Um, And then once you get through that part, the after story helps, like I said, conclude it in the mind of the person who you're interacting with. So, um, you know, to me, that's really, it's six steps are all you need to a complete story. And, um, and, and if you're starting off storytelling, you know, my suggestion is, um, and just write those points. 
you know, it's that won't get you to novel length. Don't try and shoot for novel length with these points. That mm-hmm. is not enough. Well, it's kind of um, like an outline for it. But it's a basic outline, right? And the idea is typically you want to create a pattern of failure before you get to your run. So if you're telling like a, 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 a feature length story, you're going to probably have the strike and fallout happen like three times. <laughs> Step three and four are just going to repeat three times. And it's just going to keep happening because um, y- you need those attempts. And there might not be like horrible failures. It might be like oh, a dead end or a red herring. There could be different reasons why they don't work out. It's not always, you know, facing the enemy and getting defeated. They're, they're, you know, it's like, okay, we got to this thing. It's not enough. And now we get punished by the story somehow, which causes a fallout, which forces us to move on and to get the next thing that we need. Uh, it helps create a little bit more tension where if you just have the story like the person goes to get uh, item one and two and three, which you need to defeat the foe, <laughs> it might not be quite as interesting. There won't be as much tension because they're just they're just doing steps, you know. And when you have a little pushback, you know, uh, at every level, it helps create tension for you to move on with. Um, but really, I think it's pretty simple. Six steps to the story. Um, if you want a longer story, you repeat steps three and four, you know, once you you start getting comfortable, like with a longer form story, that's still not going to be quite the length of a novel, but, uh, then you want to sit there and look, okay, do my characters have character arcs, a character arc, really the before the BS is inside of the, the book already, the, the, the after story is in the book already, but a character arc will still have an incident, which is the point they join the story. They will have failures and successes in their own arc to develop their character throughout the story until they get to whatever their run is, uh, which you know might not always happen in a character arc. There might not always be a run um, because maybe it's the person who loses, right? They, they just end up striking out, um, which is funny because I say have three strikes and you're not out. So well, it's they, not baseball. They, they, their bit might be that they quit. They and the quit. only difference yeah. between success and, and failure hero. is quitting. Mm-hmm. It's right. And um, yeah, it's whatever the purpose of the character is, you know, you use the incident strikes and fallouts and sometimes runs. They might not be major runs, but there's something that will maybe be a, a, a stepping stone to get through your plot. Um, and The other thing, too, is if you do subplots without a story, once again, it's the same thing where you're going the incident, the strike, the fallout, the run um, of a a subplot. So I have a subplot where they're going to a town. There's a reason they're going to this town. Maybe this town holds an item that they need to face the foe and not get their butt speed again, you know. And so the subplot is getting to the town, but if I create a rhythm of another story in there to do that, you know, you know, it helps create, ten, it helps give character building moments. It could be part of an arc or it might be just be part of a subplot to get there from point A to point B. You look very serious. I'm sorry. I had a, <clears throat> had a mouthful of pizza there. I couldn't comment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Michael's eating pizza in front of me because this is uh, via video calls. I literally have not had anything to eat today, so I'm just I'm sorry. I'm he's not just, a big fan just, of eating on the show, but I'm starving. So he is he is just doing this to taunt me. It's not even don't take it personally, audience. He's just being rude to me. If it makes you feel any better, it's not great pizza. Oh no. Actually makes me feel worse. Wow. I was hoping it was like really good pizza. No, I, I mean it's jealous. it's not it's not bad. You know. it's, it's, it's like average pizza around here. Like I would say, pizza? no, no, no. It's it's uh, take and bake Aldi's. So it's a 16 inch pizza for. Uh, six, so it's like a decent frozen pizza or whatever. It's, mm, yeah, it's it's actually really good considering that, but mm-hmm. it's not. Um, you know, it's not like you know. Just on a side note, for the people who aren't from the East Coast, you know, if you go from basically North Jersey to about Boston it's a pretty safe place to just buy pizza anywhere. You know, you might think it's a shady place. It's pro- more chances than not. It's going to actually be good pizza. Um, 
and I've lived in other parts of the country, and I can verify that the the quality of pizza. There's a few different styles out here, but the quality of the pizza is much better than where I grew up. Uh, uh, you know, in a couple of different places I grew up, uh, the pizza was just not nearly as good. Um, you know, if the best pizza you've ever run into is Pizza Hut or or Domino's, it's because you lived in a place like I used to. Uh, so, which they're not it's like bad pizzas, but. Um, they're 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 not to the quality of like the average mom and pop place around us. I don't think. Mm. So, uh, do you have any any story uh, build up there too? And you know, any any wisdom for the people who are starting off for a story the first time? Well, my big wisdom is always cheerleading. Um, mm-hmm. Just the basic idea that you guys can do this and. If you're just getting into writing and storytelling, just do it. Like, do it. Let it be terrible. Fail. But don't quit. Answer. Like, you know, like every GM, every, uh, you know, novelist, every story writer Mm -hmm. has told bad stories. I'm sure Stephen King has truckloads of bad stories in filing Mm -hmm. cabinets and whatever. You know what I mean? He's got a lot of bestsellers. Mm -hmm. and I bet he's got a lot of garbage sitting around the house, too. Um, the bottom line is just don't stop. And if you haven't started yet, oh, start, get on it. Yeah. Write a story and get to the end of it and be like, ugh. But here's the thing. Partway through the story, you're probably going to come up with an idea that's better than what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Put that idea aside and do that for the next one. Don't try mm-hmm. to modify what you're doing. Learn from what you're doing, but mm-hmm. complete it. Yeah. Complete it and move on to the next thing. Because the bottom line is you're always going to come up with a better idea. You're always going to come up with something that you think is going to improve what you're doing Mm -hmm. don't don't try to modify too much on the fly just get Mm -hmm. it done get it written get it complete get to the end of the story if you don't like it and you want to change it you can absolutely revise it after the fact in a second second edit in a in a Mm -hmm. second draft so to speak um but don't uh don't do too much of that on in the first go Mm -hmm. just get it done yeah and and my thing is that's so that's why i just like take my six steps and for those of you uh, who are just tuning in now, which would have been possible because it's a podcast, but <laughs> just to put them into order here at the end is, you know, it's step one before the story. What happened before before the story starts? Step two is what's the incident that starts the story off? You know, you know, your typical fantasy is, you know, uh, the villain comes to town and like kills everyone in your town or uh, some such thing. You know, there's. Uh, That's a very common one. Or they invade the neighboring country is another very popular one in epic fantasy. So, um, but you know, what's the incident? What's that point where the story really starts? Because part of it is you need to tell the other people enough information so that they can understand uh, the, the information you're throwing at them in the story. You know, otherwise, if you just start at the incident, then uh, you don't have that before story. They're not going to understand who's this guy and why is he killing everyone and why is everyone uh, here mad about him killing people over there? And, um, you know, so y- you need certain information for to be in the people's hands. And uh, that's your before story. The incident is going to be what starts off the story. And then you're going to have a series of strike and fallouts. And, a lot of times, you, you know, the, each of them could even end up with a turning point. That's typically where an act will change over, right? You know, where, you know, a turning point, um, you know, in the strike is the story is not complete, but uh, we sort of turn the tables, you know, uh, where uh, what's a good turning point? Um, and, you know, in like a first act of a story. So I think like Luke Skywalker decides to leave the, um, uh, to go with and, 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 and help save Princess Leia when he decides to leave the farm, mm. you know, it's well, kind of I would, back to one. Well, I would say, th- you know, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru getting killed would be an inciting incident. Yeah. Yeah. You, you actually even argue like that's really the starting of the story too, because before that they were just kind of building up the world. So um, yeah. Uh, the fallout, you know, is the lessons learned from the strike. And it's directly related to the strike, you know, and it could be a defeat like, you know, uh, the ending of the second act of Star Wars is I think Obi-Wan Kenobi dying, you could probably argue. Um, that's a turning point against the characters. Um, 
the flaw is that they, they, they realize, oh my goodness, one whoever this Darth Vader is is kind of a nasty guy. Uh, we should probably watch out for him. <laughs> we, kind of. Yeah, he's, he's kind of. We, we might want to watch out for this uh, Vader guy out there. So, um, and, and what do we need to do to protect ourselves? And oh God, they have the information. So we really have to take out this Death Star and this Darth Vader and we're doomed. We're doomed. That's a, a good second turning point should make you feel a little doomy, I think. <laughs> um, you know, but that's what the strikes and fallouts do. They're, they are they are the journey. And I, I like to call them strikes because I can't overemphasize enough how characters have to fail a wall. And it doesn't really have to be an, uh, an awkward or obvious fail, but they need to fail so that they can have a reason to learn. And, and triumph. To get to that final triumph. Um, so people who are, are interacting and getting the story feel like the, the, the protagonist has earned it. Otherwise it's a Mary Sue. Yeah, exactly. And then finally you get to that run. That's the fifth step, right? The run is that point of the story where, where the death star blows up, you know, then you have the after story, you know, where they get medals pinned on their Wookiee fur, which must've hurt. Well, he didn't get one. So. I know that was so wrong, but they know where to pin it. So it's kind of. Well, they didn't pin Luke or I Han. Know, but the either. It was a necklace. It was a necklace. The Wookiee style ones are only pinned. Yeah. Did you read that somewhere? I read that in a blog thing somewhere online. Okay. Michael does not believe me. Nope. He's looking at me with utter disgust. But that's kind of his normal look. So I don't know if it's any different. But uh, remember. You know, follow the six steps. If you want to make a story longer, just add some more strikes and fallouts and have those, some of those be meaning, meaningful towards you getting to that run. You know, and then, you know, you know, if you want to add more afterwards, you can go and develop character arcs. You can add in the subplots to make the story a bit more rich and maybe uh, uh, go into some more detail over, over some things that, you you know, got kind of brushed over in the basic story, but start off with those six six steps, you know? And so for your world building task of the day, write just a basic story. Don't worry about the length. Discover all, all of those six points. And share it with someone. And now for the real world task, the reason I'm talking about here on the world builders anvil and not the story builders anvil, um, and that is look at your world when you're creating worlds. Make sure that there is a purpose for stuff. You know, it's like if you ever read a story where there are characters and there are places that come up over and over again that you're like, why? That was maybe neat, but why are you telling me this as the listener? You know, <clears throat> Tom Bombadil. I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> That was very important. Tom Bombadil was very important. I mean, he plays a significant part here and there, but at the same time, he was very easily removed from the movies because he wasn't that, that important, significant. Yeah, exactly. That kind of proves that he really was maybe an additional character not needed. Yeah, he was superfluous. Um, and no one will be perfect, but you know, the thing is, in general, you create a new character because it's important to have a new character do the task. Why do I not want one of my three characters in my protagonist little group to do it? Why do I need a fourth character? You know, T and D parties are a great example of, well, cause I need a rogue. I need a cleric to cast a spell cause no one else can cast the spell. Um, but what, what is the need for having someone new do it? Um, and there are different reasons why, um, and sometimes there maybe don't, don't even become important characters, but maybe they perform an important task. Maybe they're influenced by that characters to do an important task so that they can get through and do what they want to. So, uh, just keep in mind whenever you do this, that, um, uh, think of your world. I just want you to remember to think about your world and use <clears throat> stories does it create f- things for a purpose? Does it fit? Does, does it, it make fit? sense? Mm-hmm. That's why we talk about like when we talk about world building is have that frame. And the reason why stories are so important is even if you're not planning to share the story with other people, you just you need a frame so you can feel like you're accomplishing something in your world building, if nothing else. Like 
I, I can now tell the story from A to Z, which means I've actually created this part of the world as much as I need to. And maybe there's not all of the rituals for the religion. Maybe you don't have a language written uh, for your uh, cultures that are in the area. And you can get to those things if you want to later on. But, you know, if language and the words they speak aren't that important, you don't need that. Um, it, it, It adds some nice detail, but it's not needed unless it's, you know, helps drive a story forward. And, and, and once again, and then if you want to keep building that world, you can come up with new stories to add stuff in over time. But um, I want to thank everyone for showing in today. I hope you all had the most spectacular Christmas ever. And, or whatever holiday you celebrate. Or whatever holiday you celebrate, yeah. I don't really even care if you celebrate Christmas, to be honest. But I want you to have a Merry Christmas because I, I like Christmas. And so even if you don't celebrate it, I'm going to wish you a Merry that. And whatever you celebrate, you can wish me a Merry whatever you celebrate too. Or if you wish me ill, wow, that's kind of rude. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're Michael. He's earned it. I don't wish you ill. I wish you I know. Mary. That's just because you're a good person. That's just because you're a good I person. try. I try. Yeah, don't get fooled yourself. Did we have a real world task? Uh, the real world task was to to look at your world, you know, going forward as you build and make sure there's purpose. No, that was the, that was the world building task. The that real world the real task world was task. that. Okay, I'm getting myself confused. The real the world building task was to write a basic story. Yes. We hope you all have a happy uh, uh, New Year as well. If you're celebrating a New Year now, which everyone won't be, and we'll be talking about more of that next time. Thank you so much for listening to the World Builders Anvil. We would love it if you would share the World Builders Anvil with two of your friends. And so would they. If they are unfamiliar with podcasts, then you get to introduce them to the wonderful world of podcasting. Take them to Stitcher or iTunes, or best of all, just send them to our website, www.garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com. Now strike while the myth was hot.